Wow, that looks amazing. Brian, language. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't know. I thought we were stopping. You were we talking. Were, there were actually the forks and knives here behind you. My <laughs> Brian, <laughs> language. <laughs> <laughs> in Oregon, a city where abundant farmers markets, bustling food carts, unique restaurants, and an eclectic community converge to create one of the best food cities in America. Portland has that energy, you know, like they support an artisan, they support somebody trying to do it right. And so we started making handmade salamis and sausages and the town showed up and supported me and forever thankful. We headed over to meet Eli Cairo, owner of Olympia Provisions, who has been thriving in Portland's artisanal charcuterie community. When I say I'm a charcuterie maker, it's if you translate it, like take all the romance out of it, I'm just a value added meat maker. You have to make every piece of this amazing animal to the perfect texture, the perfect seasoning, and make no matter who the fanciest palate is out there, think they're eating the best ribeye in the world. That's like the, the true art. A first generation Greek American, Eli was introduced to charcuterie making by his father. After apprenticing for five years in Switzerland, he brings to Portland old world curing and sausage making techniques that are rarely found in America. My apprenticeship was in Switzerland. And if there is a more detailed oriented culture in the whole world about this is the way it is, perfection is done this way, everything needs to be done this way to enjoy yourself later on, that's the society. You know, you come in every single day from the way you set up your operation to the way you clean, to the way you grind your spices, the way you handle the proteins and the animals. It's all about doing it perfectly. We started at the 38,000 square foot meat plant where Eli's team butchers, smokes, cures, and packs thousands of pounds of charcuterie each day. Here at the plant, you gotta get all dressed up to make sure it stays clean and sanitized. And so you got hair net, beard net, and a schmock. You're gonna look fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait. What do the kids do? How, how far up do they button? I'd leave the top one open, that looks good. One thing that makes Olympia Provisions unique is that they grind their own fresh spices daily. So yeah, this is definitely a uh, forgotten art in the sausage world in America. Paul formulates these recipes every single day, gets them all ready, all real spices. He just ground them and he puts them through a big sieve that he's doing it right there. Then we fold them into our products. Next, we were off to the raw cooler, where the sustainably sourced pastured pork is butchered, ground, and prepared. This is it, raw meat comes in here. Grinder for salami sausage there. The batter machine takes away all the sinew as he's butchering all day, sorting all the meat. So yeah, he's cutting capicolas, the shoulders of the, of the pig that comes off the top of it. One of the most prized cuts of the entire pig. It's one of the only ones that has exactly 30% fat. And that's kind of what we strive for. Then we'll salt this with chili flake, stay here for seven days, then we'll take it out, we'll, we'll coat it in the dry spices, put it in the net, into the smokehouse to be steamed, and off to the races. This is a stuffing floor. So this is uh, the bratwurst here? Yeah, this is brat, yeah. Inside this machine, you have a small vacuum pump and a hopper and an auger. The auger moves around, gets into a compartment, a small vacuum pulls all the air out of it. So you get that really tight bind when you're eating those sausages, there's no, there's no air in it. So yeah, this is the bratwurst. You guys can come see the smoke generator too. It literally just smokes and smolders kind of like an incense. And then that goes up and over, you can see. And then the humidity as we go will adjust and it'll change as it goes. And this is our hot dogs. We get to eat one of these, right, Nick? Sweet. This is a game-changing experience. That's so creamy. Mm -hmm. And that snap is amazing. The snapping is like the, the fat hasn't quite congealed yet in there. So it's yeah. the moistest you'll ever get it. That's incredible. Have it, huh? Oh my gosh. The crown jewel of Olympia Provisions and Eli's pride and joy is its renowned salamaria. Using old world techniques, Eli ferments his salami the natural way, with mold. So this is a, essentially a gigantic meat sauna. We're at about 100% humidity, so it's essentially raining in here. And we're about uh, 85 degrees. Inside here is where fermentation starts. We're holding raw ground meat directly in the danger zone. So you're essentially racing pathogens with the souring of the salami. This uh, takes me about two days. Most salami factories in America, this is done in about two hours. Salamis come out of the incubator. This is them the next day. You can see they start forming their natural mold on the outside. As we walk down, you'll see they get a little bit older and a little bit closer to being done. So in here, it's what you're trying to do is the salt will bring moisture to the outside. 
outside, pulls the moisture out with that, it carries the yeast. The molds that we create and propagate in this room catch onto those yeast, they bloom. Just wild mold spores just spreading everywhere. This is where we hand wrap salami. So we hand wrap everyone just like a cigar. Most salami producers in America cover them up with milk powder or rice flour to make it look like salami. I'm one of the only people that use live molded salamis. The factory was an amazing display of traditional recipes and modern technology. Back at the restaurant, Eli showed me how to make one of his favorite sausage dishes, chucrut garni. Chucrut garni, of course, sauerkraut garnished is what that means. So first off, I like to do the potatoes a little bit ahead of time, and it's equal part sauerkraut juice and water and a little bit of salt. Then you simmer them until they're completely tender, and then pull them off just so they can suck up all that like soury saltness for a minute. And then to start with the sauerkraut, you take a big chunk of your landrauch chicken. If you can't find landrauch chicken, just use bacon or back bacon or any kind of smoked um, belly parts. I like to cut it into pretty good sized chunk like that. You can see how pretty it is. Wow. So you got the loin, the beautiful fat back on there. And then essentially we're just gonna keep, we're gonna cut them into the kind of large lardones. I like them a little bit fattier in my croup. So it kind of, you know, I don't, I want them to render because we're gonna use the fat in the kraut, but I also want them to be like a chunk of meat inside of there. So you get a, another extra little bite of delicious. So the frankfurters I don't do anything with, except I just cut them in half. So they'll fit in the pan pretty easy. Bratwursts and the, the kielbasa, I like to give them a score to make sure they get a little crispier in the pan. So just score, go to the kielbasa, same routine, that going. And then the ham, sirloin tip ham. It has brown sugar, sea salt, onions, garlic, real, real, real spices like coriander, no dried peppers or anything like that. And then you brine inject it, 18 days in brine, then you smoke it for about 10 hours over applewood in the smokehouse. It's fully cooked and ready to go. Sirloin tips, sweetheart hams are real lean, so you don't wanna, you don't wanna overcook it in your kraut. You just wanna heat it up. We're doing two, that was look beautiful. Nice and moist, gorgeous little ham. So now we're kind of ready to start the cooking process. Go ahead and add the landrauk schinken. Pretty simple, you're just kind of getting it to render. And hopefully if you keep it enough uh, pan space in there, kind of like that right there, you'll hope to get a little caramelization on each one of them. The fat released from the Landrau Schenken will help balance the acidic bite of the sauerkraut that Eli ferments in-house for over a month. Oh, damn. oh my God, that smells so good. This is the kraut we make, dill, caraway. This is off dry Riesling. I, I think it's kind of nice to have a little bit of sweetness in the wine. If you don't have it, dry Riesling or any white wine will do it bring it to a boil. So I'll throw a lid on top of it of some sort. It's a pretty fancy lid we have here. While the sauerkraut cooks, Eli begins to brown the sausages in order to give them a crisp, snappy bite. The little cross hatches, you see that's what I, the outside of them gets a little crunchy. It'll be a little extra texture in there. Nice and brown. Potatoes are looking nice and easy. And since that's about right, I'll go ahead and really lower the heat. And like I said earlier, the ham, you just barely want to heat up. So we'll just go ahead and put this down right in the middle there. Now that we'll turn that down just a hair, go ahead and take your kraut, watch the fat, it's gonna do fatty things. Potatoes all around, this should be completely tender. One last little simmer on that. Go ahead and grab your warm bowl. So put the potatoes and the kraut down. Go ahead and stack your, bury some of them in. I kind of like it to look like it just kind of fell. I'll just give this to you then and you can eat it. Yeah, it's good. How's the whole thing right now? Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I didn't know I thought we were stopping. You were we talking. Were. There's actually the forks and knives here behind you, my friend. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> language. <laughs> You'd eat that, right? Oh my God, yeah, looks amazing. Oh, right? A whole lot of sausage. It's a whole lot of sausage. <laughs> Finally, the time had come for Eli and me to sit down and dive into this beautiful bowl of sauerkraut, potatoes, and sausage. I'm gonna give you a lot of sausages so you try all the different sausages I make. We're gonna give you the whole bratwurst, the whole bratwurst. because, you know, you're growing. We gotta make sure you're <laughs> growing, boy. Mm -hmm. What should we have first? I'm gonna go, go with that ham. ham. See what you think. Mm. So good. Thank you. Yeah, you really taste the brine. Thank you. And the smoke is, is there, but it's delicate. For any smoke product in my mind, the first thing you don't want to taste at it is smoke. 
you kind of want it to play like supporting role, if you will. You taste it, you get the flavor of everything. In the background, but ooh, there's a nice little hit of smoke. And do you switch out the types of wood that you use for each one of these uh, products? For the most part, we keep like a classic mix on it. For the land that are shaking, sometimes we'll add a darker wood to pick up color. The way it is is we use fruit woods. It's like the apples, the cherries, the pear woods to get sweetness into a meat. And then you put hardwoods into it to color the outside of it harder. So like a hickory, wow. um, any of the other darker woods, the birches will uh, really add color onto the outside of it, like a cosmetic. It also gives it like a more of a bitter tannin so smoke to resiny it. kind of. Yeah, exactly. Like so, yeah, very well said. So bratwurst is super delicious. Yeah, it's it's a bratwurst is kind of like the base for every sausage maker. You have to make a good bratwurst. Like I, if I go to another sausage maker's shop. First thing I order is a bratwurst. And there's like a few things that separate it right out the gate is, is if they're using dried spices or pre-ground spices or not using uh, fresh garlic or whatever it is that they're flavoring it. If they're cutting a corner there, that's where it is. And every one of these sausages, which I think is totally makes our product a little bit different than most of them is their fresh ground spices every single day. In my mind, it should be seasoned, but you should not necessarily taste it. You should just do exactly what you did. Taste it and be like, wow, that's really good bratwurst. Yeah. And then be like, it's the spices, yeah, the every, nutmeg. Yeah, everything's playing really nice together. It, it's awesome. like nothing like jumps out and hits you over the head. It's like, it's kind of classic, right? If you, if it makes your job easier, it's probably going to make it taste less delicious. So it seems like you you care more than probably a lot of people do. Like what how how did you get this level of passion for doing such a thorough and perfect job on all this stuff? God, I don't I don't I guess it's I don't even know how I got it that way. I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of employees that have been here throughout the duration of the company that have seen where we started. That attention to detail when I would make 200 pounds of sausage a week and I was, everything was exactly it. And we've kind of always just agreed that's what's gonna make us different. So as we scale, it wasn't like make it faster, quicker, easier. It was like, hey, make sure it tastes just as good and as throughout the years keep getting better at it. This is sold across America. Somebody has never heard of my company in Boston, for example. They're gonna go to Whole Foods, they're gonna buy my Kesa Kreiner, they're gonna sit down and I want them to instantly be like, this is not a normal sausage, right? And the only way to do that is to keep it fresh, make it delicious and keep your flavor compass on point. If, like if it's not perfect to you, don't sell it to somebody. Keep it perfect and then they're gonna appreciate it. I appreciate it, yeah, it's, it's great. Cheers, bro. Thanks, man, I really appreciate really it. That was really incredible. Thank you so much. I had a great time here in Portland, Oregon, checking out the local flavor. If you see something you'd like to come to town and eat or even try to make it home, throw a comment down below. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I think we're wearing this guy out. Yeah, he's had a good day, <laughs> huh? Time for some pet treats. How about